Good morning, church. How is everyone this morning? Good. We are so happy all of you chose to come to church this morning because it warms our hearts to see all of your faces. So we thank you for being here. Y'all can start making your way back to your seats as we prepare for the message today. Um, my name is Bria Owens, and I have the honor of reading the scripture um, that Ben will be um, pouring into as he gives his sermons today. And so um, you can read it on the screen, um, read it in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we do have some out there, um, which you are free to take home with you. And we love that because this is a living, breathing word of God. Um, and we think that pouring into it um, daily is really important. Um, so I will start our scripture today. It is Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Are you thankful for the word today? Yeah? I am. Um, let's pray really quick. God, thank you for your word. Do you give us ears to hear? A mind that's willing to receive and put aside all other thoughts and a heart, most of all, that's willing and ready to act in obedience. God, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you know, as I heard that word today and I asked the question, are you thankful for the word? I just am reminded of how thankful I am for it. And um, I do believe that the most important things in our faith are the, some of the first things that Satan will begin to question in your life. And we will spend our time reading lots of things and taking in lots of information, but neglect the one thing that is alive and actually works within our life. I heard a statistic this weekend that um, using statistics from Twitter and doing all the stuff through Fuller University, I'm pretty sure it's Fuller that did it, that um, misinformation travels at six times the speed as the truth. Six times the speed. And you know why that is? It's not because it's faster. It's not like cheetah, right? It's, it's because we're willing to consume and redistribute information that's not true. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. I think that is what happens when you have an enemy who's a liar. And would love for you to embrace and to share things that weren't the truth. And then to neglect the one thing that is. And I'm not here to be like, you got to read your Bibles. But I'm here to say, just read your Bibles. Like, I just want to encourage you in that. Like, get a Bible. We have them today. We just, and here where I'm really proud of you, we stocked up today. Uh, uh, so one of our hosting members was like, hey, where's... Do we have extra Bibles? We've given them away. I want to keep giving them away. I want to give you more, like, like, just, like, get a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, like, get one. And uh, if you don't know how to read it, I'd love to help you start reading it. But I'll tell you in a minute when we get to our four questions an easy way to start. So um, we're in the series. I've already set it up a little bit. If you weren't here at that point, I'm sorry. You'll be okay. Um, Luke chapter 1, though, this is before Jesus' death and resurrection. This is in the text of Luke. He speaks about something that's to come that we're experiencing today. A new day will dawn on us from above because our God, your God, my God, look at this, is loving and merciful. So what he's about to say, the new thing that's dawning, right, that's actually showing us this happens after Jesus' um, defeat of death in his resurrection. That which is coming is because of a loving and merciful God. Does that make sense? Like, so what we're about to hear comes out of the character of his love and his mercy. He will give light to those who live in the dark. Why? Because he's loving and he's merciful and in death's shadows. He will guide us. He will lead you in the way of peace. So we're in a sermon series called um, The Dawn of Peace. We're in week three. Two weeks ago, Mimi asked me, what are we supposed to write in that message slot? And so I'm going to try better at telling you the title of the message. So today I would have titled it Peaceful Relationships. You see, I wrote in my journal this week, the key to seeing peace in our soul is investing wisely in the areas of relationships. Um, 
I like to tell you uh, our kind of travel stories, right? If you didn't see, um, I had a chance of hang gliding last night. And uh, David Stilwell said, I didn't think you were going to be here today. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. I thought, I, th- I think, I guess he just thought I was going to die. Um, and he, he also didn't, like, if he truly believed that, he didn't even try to stop me. Like, nothing. I walked in, he's like, I didn't think you were going to be here today. I'm like, okay. <laughs> anyway, I know, I know. I, that's what I said. Man. He, but less profanity, though, okay? Jeez. House of the Lord. Um, <laughs> One of my favorite kind of adventure stories is actually the adventure of adopting our children and going to Korea and things like that. And the first time we got into Korea, I realized that we make cultural decisions without thinking about them. And different cultures come, cultures come to different conclusions. And it's not like there's been a meeting. There's not like we all decide something, but we make decisions, right? So let me give you a situation and you tell me what you would do. Let's say you were in New York. I know, you don't want to go there. I get it, right? You live here for a reason. Let's say you're in New York. You're having to take the subway, and you get on the subway, and it's packed. And on the walls, we've allowed um, the elderly and women to sit, maybe someone who's pregnant to sit. And so you're standing. Let's say it gets really full, okay? So now the person who's sitting down, you're standing next to, right? Um, what's your choice in that moment? Like, are you facing them, or are you giving them your backside? Can we just take a vote really quick? Who's giving them the front side? Anybody? Okay, a few front siders, okay? Okay, we'll talk about that later. Who's giving them the back side, right? Okay, some of you just aren't doing it. You're like, I'm going to give them my hip or something. There's the only two options in this situation. In Korea, they've made a universal decision, and they say you give them your front side. And I disagree with this decision because it doesn't change the experience for them very much, but it changes my experience a whole lot, right? Because now I have to look at you this entire time. And this is a true story. I was on, we were on the train. It was very awkward for me. I don't mind awkward silence, but I do not enjoy awkward moments, right? And we're standing there, and the second I'm standing there, and I'm standing just, let's just be honest, crotch to face with somebody sitting right there. I remember looking around this packed thing and going, I asked the question to break the ice. I bet you're wondering why I called this meeting. I thought that was funny. No one else laughed. My wife did not think it was funny either. (laughs) But here's the truth. In many respects, the subway is kind of a microcosm of our world today. It's a large, impersonal institution where we isolate ourselves and independence is like the uniform of the day, right? And like, like, like we're, we're not worried about your situation or your things. We're just as long as we don't have to experience it with you, right? I think it shows us this, too, that people can be surrounded by other people in a crowded setting and not experience meaningful relationships, right? You can be a part of a company and not build a meaningful relationship. You can be a part of a club. You can be a part of a church. Some of you have become masters of that here. You've come to collectivists and enjoy it, and you have not built a meaningful relationship yet. It's not because we don't want to build relationships with you. It's because we've chosen this in this moment that we can share carpool with somebody. You can share an office with somebody. You Listen to me. You can even share a home with people. And neglect having significant relationships. And today, I want to teach you, show to you, the biblical way and view of having peaceful relationships. Because the reason we don't build significant relationships is out of a fear that they won't be peaceful relationships. You know what I mean? Right? Like, like you're like, I don't want to get too close to anybody because I don't want it to go south, right? So, four questions. What's God wants us to know? Why does he want us to know it? What's he wants us to do? What will be the results? Pull out your worship guide. It's going to be there. Hey, and today, remember when I said, hey, grab a Bible. You need to start reading. You say, I don't know how. Here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Start in what's called the New Testament, which is the last third of your Bible. It's when Jesus comes on the scene. The first four books are called the Gospels. They're firsthand experiences of Jesus. Choose one of them, any of them. Choose any of four of those. Start reading about Jesus and ask yourself those four questions. Read, read uh, you know, read 10 verses a day. I don't know, whatever. And just say, what's God want me to know? Why does he want me to know it? What's he want me to do? What will be the results? It'll dramatically change your life. So what's God want us to know? We're going to get there in a second. Before we do, i got to tell you something. This week's message and next week's message might be the most practical messages I've ever given. Today's message has a lot of things in it that is not completely new, things that I've taught before. But I want you to understand something with this week, and it's that I'm still learning, okay? So before I get into it, can you turn to somebody next to you or just shout at me and just say, I'm still learning. Turn to somebody or shout at me. I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And let me tell you why, because next week is going to be the same. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of foreshadowing of next week. Next week is one you don't want to miss. If you know me, maybe you trust me. 
Have you ever had a preacher uh, or a friend or whoever, we'll, call them, we'll say a preacher, and you like what they teach most of the time or, or you agree with it, but you're always just afraid you're crossing your fingers about the next week a little bit, right? I hope that's not here. I hope when you invite friends, you don't cross your fingers like, oh, man, I don't know about this week. And next week is one of those that in most situations you might cross your fingers. But I want you to know I think you should come super excited and bring friends. And here's why. Next week we're talking about peace of mind. And I'm going to be honest with you. This is going to be an obedient step for me in the word of God. Um, because I love to teach about the mind, two areas specifically, taking every thought captive. I love teaching about that. I love teaching about repentance, which is metanoia, which means to change your mind. But you know what I don't like to really dive into, and it's something that is actually just really penetrating our world today. And I got really convicted this week that the church isn't playing a good, better role in this. And it's actually just dealing with our mental health in general. And so next week we're looking at the Bible and looking at mental health. Not just me, we're speaking to some professionals in this world as well with some friends that we partner with at United Counseling. Or hopefully they're going to be here with us. We're still buttoning that up a little bit. And we're going to talk about some practical ways. I'm going to share some personal stories about um, some ways that I've struggled through this in the last couple of years as well. And I think it's going to be a really significant day. So if you know someone um, who struggled with mental health, have a friend, a family member, and you're trying to understand them better as well, you should come. Maybe it's something you're dealing with. You should come. There should be a pack room next Sunday because we would be lying to ourselves if we thought we didn't have anything we're struggling with mentally. Does that make sense? And I want you to know that your mind is a battlefield for the enemy, and so we're going to work on that some too. Sound good? All right. So I'm learning. What's God want me to know when it comes to peaceful relationships? Relationships are spiritual. Now, what some of you heard me say was relationships are important. That is not what I said. They are important, but I want you to understand clearly that they're spiritual. We've taught about this before, but they are spiritual, and because they're spiritual, um, we need to understand some things about them, that all relationships, no matter your relationship, are spiritual at some level. Your work relationships, your friends, your marriages, your kids, your church, they're all spiritual. Where there's closeness of any level, people rub off, right? Like we see this in the beginning when God creates man and woman and asks them to multiply. He's not just talking about multiplying um, as in having children. He's also talking about multiplying what they are. Well, who they are is what they're becoming. And what they're becoming is what they're reproducing, right? Um, and so uh, this is why we've given this example before, and it's true. And I wrote it down so you could take a picture if you wanted to. By the way, there's permission there too. I gave it last week, and it helped a lot. I go fast. And I talk about lots of things that I write in my journal that are really long. I read fast. So if you want to pull your phone out and take a picture of something, um, you'll get, like, two prizes. Number one, you'll get the, that prize. Number two, you'll get me, like, totally not aware you're taking a picture, and I'll have a funny face. It's good. And so my eyes will be closed always. <laughs> you can't tell me ten sermons that have changed your life, but you can tell me ten people who have. Some of you are like, I don't know about that. I can't tell you ten sermons that have changed my life. And I preached them. Now, here's the truth. If I ask you to tell me 10 sermons, you might could sit here. You might could figure it out. You might get 10 down. But if I ask you to tell me 10 people that changed your life for the good or the bad, like they're in your brain right now, right? Like they've had an impact on your life. Why? It's because God made it this way. Like because his intent from the beginning was for multiplication, for blessings and spirituality to be multiplied. But there's also a problem. We have an enemy and who's also aware of this truth and the truth that God created relationships to be influential and powerful. And that's why today we need peaceful relationships. So why does God want us to know this? If relationships are spiritual and we need to know this because it will also experience spiritual attacks. So now when you have attacks within your relationships and you come to the acknowledgement that your relationships are spiritual, then we can actually know how to fight this thing, right? Scripture says your fight, for your fight is not with flesh and blood, but with the supernatural, with the spiritual. And see, Satan understands that God's intent is to bless generations to come through strategic uh, relationships. So in an effort to mess this up, listen, Satan decided that his number one attack, I believe this, I believe his number one attack against God and against God's people would be to weasel himself into every good relationship, destroy it through the people so that, look at this, don't miss this, I wrote this in my journal. Satan knew that if he could destroy relationships, he could also destroy future ones to come. That's why if Satan could attack one area of your life, it would be relationships. Why? Because Satan wants to break good generational cycles and create bad ones. Um, he wants to. It's his greatest desire. Here, and we'll talk about this some. Some of you don't know how you feel about this. The biggest hurt in your family came through what? A relationship, right? 
your biggest hurt in your friend groups came through what? Relationship. Just be honest. Your biggest hurt in the church came through what? My biggest hurt in the church came through. My biggest hurt in the real church came through this church, a church I love, a church that we're like, you know what, we will never, we're going to do everything we can for this to be a place that doesn't hurt you. I can't control people. And where there's closeness and where there's relationship, there is an opportunity for blessings to come or for division to be had. And it's true. Listen, I can wear out statistics. I'm not going to read a bunch of them because you know me. I'm not very smart. But I did check these statistics. They're really good. And they're heartbreaking. And you don't like them. And I don't like them. And this shows what the enemy does when he can break good generational cycles and establish bad ones. 97% of kids who suffer abuse go on to abuse others. Statistics. Does that mean that if you were abused, you're going to abuse others? No, not absolutely not. Because we're going to talk about breaking these generational cycles. Listen, I, we, 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 I'm just telling you, it's, it's true. People who come from broken homes are 172% more likely to get divorced themselves. Does it mean you're getting a divorce? No, it does not mean that. I'm telling you that Satan is using relationships in order to bring chaos and turmoil into your life. And if he can attack one area of your life, it's going to be your relationships. Some of you are at this church because you're in another church where a relationship hurt you. And I want you to, to do a couple things. Um, I want you to, we're going to talk about it in a minute, but I'm going to say it now. I want you to forgive them. I want you to release them. I want you to build up a tolerance to understand we're going to get there in a second. Never mind. That's why in Exodus 34, we skip the verse that says the sins of the father were passed on to the third and fourth generation. People get upset when I read this and they're like, well, that's not fair. Why would God do that? God didn't do that. We did that. God wasn't punishing them because they did something really bad. God was simply stating that because of the way that I created you, right? I created you to be a blessing to others, to have blessings poured into your life. Like I created you so that the kids that you hear in the other room will stand on your shoulders. Now you get to choose what they're looking into. Are they going to look into an unhealthy relationship? Are they going to look into brokenness? Are they going to, no, no, no. Or are they going to stand on the shoulders of giants that can show them spaces in the heavenly that we can't even see? God created it for that reason. But, but in our free will, sin won't just affect you. It actually gets passed down. And relationships are spiritual, and that's why. It's a conduit. I had a buddy. He was a hoodlum. Man, he was a hoodlum. I don't even know if I can, I don't even know if I'm saying that word right now. Have you ever said a word a couple of times? I'm like, I don't know if that's how you say that word. <laughs> My wife told me about that last week. There's some word I said like three different ways last week. Um, but he was, and uh, we had a gas spike in like 2000, I guess close to 2004. It went to like a whole dollar seventy nine. Y'all don't freak out, right? Um, it went from ninety nine cents to like a dollar seventy nine within a couple of years span. And everybody was freaking out. And so my buddy decided um, to take advantage, and he started siphoning gas. Um, if you don't know what siphoning gas is, you're in for a treat. I'm about to teach you how to do it. And so um, I will say to our Calera police officers, if you see anybody siphoning gas, and they came from here, I did not say it was okay. I'm just telling you how. So if you don't know how to siphon gas, I mean, it's pretty simple. You take a water hose, you stick it into a gas tank, and you suck on the water hose until gas comes out, right? I asked him one time. By the way, you ever had met somebody who just has bad breath all the time? You know what I'm talking about? Like permanent bad breath no matter what they do. Don't look at the person next to you. Right? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> like I don't think scientists can figure out why that is. I think I have a clue. I think it's people who siphoned gas back in the early 2000s, right? I think it just permanently messed you up internally. Um, and so now we know. Now we know. Um, but he would, I asked him one time, I said, how do you know when to quit sucking on the hose? And he goes, when you taste gas. And I'm like, that's disgusting. You're gross. And I remember that moment, looking back on it, thinking, why would he ever do that? Like, I know why he did that. But then I remembered, I had an opposite experience with, with hose, right? I played outside a lot, and I would turn on the water, and I don't care who you are, what city you're in, how gross your water is, nothing is as good as hose water after you've got through playing outside. There's nothing better. Now, let me just tell you this. If you're new to this, if you're a child who's never been outside before, don't go straight to the pipe with it and turn it on. You're going to get burned up, okay? You got to let it run a second, right? I care about you. You know that, right? I'm teaching you the good things. Right? There's nothing better. And by the way, the hose manufacturers aren't going back. And I'm not calling them and going, man, I want you to know, every time I put it in your mouth on that hose, it tastes like gasoline. And they're going to be like, well, where is the hose connected? Right? 
right? Is it hooked up to a faucet where it's supposed to be? If so, you're missing some goodness. I don't know why you're, like, we don't go around to our plants and water them with gas. We're like, well, this is the water hose, so I guess this is what it does, right? Just because the hose was used for something it wasn't supposed to be used for doesn't mean we judge what it is. Does that make sense? And we do that. Like, why would God make our sins and our negative things passed down from generation to generation? And God's saying, what's it connected to? Like, what are we? No, 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 you misunderstood. I want you to pour out goodness, mercy, blessings. I want you to pour out the fruit of the spirits to the next generation. Guess what? If you can align your life, break some old generational cycles, start some good ones, guess what your kids are going to get to experience? We want to change their life. I think we've got to change ours first. Like, you want to come here and we want to be like, man, I hope Miss Candace and Miss Paige pour into that next generation. Listen, the cycle needs to stop with you. Right? We got to make some things. Like, I'll be honest. And then listen, listen, grace, mercy in this place. You need to understand that. Everyone who's here, you've been through multiple marriages. You've been through hardship. This is a zero judgment on this. But I just need you to know something. The reason me and my wife have stayed together as long as we've stayed together isn't because we love each other so much. We do love each other so much. I love it so much. We went, again, we went hang gliding yesterday. We had, you know, I don't know if it means we love each other or not. Um, anyways. <laughs> Maybe the opposite. <laughs> Anyways, we made a rule in the beginning. I, I wouldn't say it from the same, like we won't say the word divorce in our house. We just won't say it. You can get mad at me. You can scream at me. You can tell me how wrong things are. We won't say it because the second you say it is just one step away from doing it. We won't say it. We won't say it. We don't say it when we want to really mean. We won't say it when we want to make the threat bigger. We don't say it. And some of you've said it. You need to make a rule today. Don't say it. You're not gonna say it. It's not fighting fair, and it's not how it's going to happen, right? And if I'm trying to change any statistic, it's one of them, right? Why? Because the gospel's good news. All right, so let's continue on. Now, some of you are thinking this sounds like a lot of work. You're asking me to fix a lot of relationships, and I don't want to do that work. And I want you to hear this. Then you're going to miss the blessing. Don't miss it. The relationships will continue to be a conduit for hurt, for judgment, for offense, for chaos. And you see, Satan has an agenda. John chapter 10, verse 10, we've read it a million times. What's his agenda? To steal, kill, and destroy. Right? What's his vehicle to do this, though? People. People. Relationships. It's how he does most of this. And his strategy within those relationships is divisiveness and division. If he can divide you a little bit, if you can create some divisiveness, because of this, Satan creates this illusion that you've been hurt by God when it comes to the church and some other relationships. When the truth is you've been hurt by God's people, and they are God's people. But God's agenda is the opposite, and often is the opposite of Satan's agenda, and Satan often speaks the opposite of what God speaks. And so his agenda for your life, continue John chapter 10, verse 10, but I come to give you life and life to the full. Now, what's interesting is that he uses the exact same vehicle, people. Biggest blessings in your life, people, right, relationships. And God's strategy for this is not divisiveness and division, but unity and kindness. Paul writes to the church of Ephesus in chapter 4, look at this with me. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Paul writes to the church of Rome and speaks about how kindness turns a hard heart. He says, or do you presume that on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? People come to Jesus. Why? Because of the obedient hearts of God's people. And the question is, or the question I asked myself this week is, whose kingdom agenda will you adopt as your agenda and as your outward expression of your kingdom identity? See, a kingdom of darkness wants things to be about me. But the truth is this, I need you to hear this. A siloed life is the same as a divisive life. You're thinking, no, I'm removing myself. And the choice to live divided among others is limiting the kingdom potential that's in your life. Yes, you're right, you're not in relationships that are hurting you, but you're also not in the relationships that are blessing you. And no longer are you seeing this kingdom contribution that you can add to other believers as well. You can't pass something on to someone you're not willing to sit next to. Right? You can't 
change someone's life and offer them the goodness and mercy of Jesus if you won't actually be in a relationship with them. And a kingdom-minded life is one that strives to be united and reveal the goodness and graciousness of a saving God. So what's God want me to do? Well, if we can say that, that relationships are spiritual, and we can also identify, identify since they're spiritual, that they are open to spiritual attacks as well, then I believe it would be smart of us to identify any possible threats. Now, I'm not going to talk on these threats for long. I'm not even going to put them up there. But if you're with us for the first time or you've never picked up a copy of this, there's a free book that we give away. It's called Proper Perspective. The first three chapters cover these three things. First three things. I think a majority of the threats within your relationships boil down to three things. I'm not going to say all. It's not exclusive. It's pretty close to exclusive. Offense, guilt, or jealousy. Offense, guilt, or jealousy. Again, I won't talk about it long because you can get a free book and you can read three chapters. They're not very long chapters. You can do it over lunch. Um, And you can learn a lot more about this than I could teach in this time. But you need to identify what the threat is in the relationship that you're struggling with. Is it offense? Is it guilt? Is it jealousy? Now let me take a little pause on offense for a second. Talk to married couples or people in relationship or people who plan to get one day get married. Best marriage advice I give is this. That expectations that are unmet become an incubator for offense in any relationship. Like when there's an unmet expectation, it might seem really small on the surface. You might not even say anything about it. But over time, it becomes an incubator for something, for an offense in a relationship that begins to divide it. I write it this way, and this is what I tell married couples a lot in our counseling time. The root of most unmet expectations is unexpressed expectations. And many times we're like, well, they should know by now. Well, they don't. So express them. Well, if they would just look, no. If we can express our expectations, we're going to find ourselves with far less unmet expectations. Now, that comes to offense. When it comes to guilt and jealousy, all of these three things, the reason they are so effective by the enemy within your relationships is because spiritual relationships need closeness and intimacy for things to get passed down. And all of these things, offense, jealousy, and guilt, they bring a debt with them. And where there's a debt, there cannot be intimacy. You don't believe me, right? You've never been in debt before then. You didn't answer the call when they called the 40th time. Why? Because you ain't going to talk to that person when you're in debt. And offense is saying that they owe, I, uh, they owe me. Guilt is saying I owe you. Jealousy might be the worst one. It's saying God owes me. And where there's this debt, there can't be intimacy. They also, the threats that we identify actually reveal some internal deficiencies. Look at Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 5 pretty much the rest of the time. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. By the way, that's a good rule within relationships as well. I haven't mentioned that one today. Don't murder people. All right? Even if it's not on purpose and you just say things like we're going go hang gliding today or anything, just don't do it. And so this is the beginning, let me pause, of six Mosaic laws, that, the, the beginning of a series of six Mosaic laws in Scripture that Jesus starts to expand on. And Jesus came to fulfill this old covenant and reveal it to its full detail, and that's what he's doing in this moment. Um, and it's a perfect example of that. And in this moment, Jesus is talking about the old laws of Moses, this Mosaic covenant, and revealing some truths. And he's saying, you've heard, do not murder this Mosaic law. But let me show it to you in greater detail. And by the way, let's pause for a second. That's the neat thing about what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to do a lot of things, but one of the things that's got this God on high that was speaking through prophets and a few others now could be, be seen in great detail. And though he didn't come to abolish the old, he did make the old look different because anytime you see something fulfilled, it looks be- different than how it started. Here's an example. You ever seen somebody um, do something on a drafting table versus what it looks like when it's done? Have you ever seen a rough draft versus a finished draft? We didn't abolish the beginning. We fulfilled it, which means its full potential has come to be. And so what he's coming, he's not abolishing this law. He's not saying you shall not murder is wrong. He's saying you heard you shall not murder. But let me clarify that a little bit more with great detail. It doesn't get rid of it. It actually extends it. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus, we could have just kept the old way, right? Again, let me just say this. Before you see the fruit that is your life, there was a seed that was planted in your heart. Before you see the outward, there was always an inward. This passage continues and continues. Um, 
uh, so no, I said that prior to something being revealed through your life, it took root in your heart. This is the passage to Jews. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, and we talked about this word before, it's not actually a word. It's a sound. It's translated as raka. The sound, my wife will divorce me because of this. It's the sound of hawking a loogie. That's what it is. It says, anyone who says to a brother or sister, and if I was 9 o'clock service, I could do this, but my wife's not here. But I can't do it now because she'll judge me for it. And then that sound, right? Like it's like looking at someone and acting like you're going to spit on them. It's looking at someone bowing up and that makes sense, right? He says, but anyone, anyone who does that is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, watch out now, we in church, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Hold up. Don't like that. Let me clarify a little bit, make you feel a little bit at ease, but not terribly at ease. Um, the word for hell here that's being used is the word Gehenna. Gehenna um, was a place in the Jewish culture that during some pagan practices of religion, um, child sacrifices were being made. And they were throwing them in this garbage dump called Gehenna. One day they decided to um, burn this entire garbage dump uh, for whatever reason. And there's a Jewish saying back then that the fires of Gehenna, Gehenna smolder on. That the fires never went out. And that's why we get this translation of hell from this word Gehenna. And let me clarify, Jesus is not saying that you're going to hell. Why? Because you actually don't have to be in the fire to be affected by it. See, where there's a threat within your relationships, symptoms of hell sneak in. Right? Your home can become a living hell by what you allow to access your heart. These relationships will stand in opposition to the peace that Jesus longs to grant. Parenting becomes hell. Marriage becomes hell. Work becomes hell. This is what I wrote down. If you allow something to dwell in your heart against your brother or your sister, and then allow it to go unchecked for long enough, it will literally create a smoldering garbage dump of fire in the very relationship, maybe you were standing at the aisle with them, that at one point you would, said you would do anything for. It's why that person who you smiled at on that wedding day now makes your blood boil when they walk in the room. Because you've allowed these threats to go unseen. And see, what starts in the heart does not dwell there forever. There's um, I had a friend, Dinko Slotoff, he's a missionary in Bulgaria. He likes sunflower seeds. And uh, he eats sunflower seeds while we're going down the road. Sometimes he spits them out the window. Sometimes he spits them in the cup. Sometimes he just spits them, if I'm being honest. And one day the air conditioner was blowing, he spit a sunflower seed. I don't know which of the three options he was going for, but none of them landed. It landed back in his eyeball, right? And uh, I'm pretty sure we bought these from the States. They don't get a lot of different flavors of sunflower seeds. So it could have been like hot torture barbecue Cheeto breath, you know. I don't know what it was. But it hit his eye, and at first he was like, oh, that hurt. And then it got worse. And then it started, uh, over time, he, he had to keep it closed. And then they tried to flush it out. And then we had to go to the doctor and it ended up getting infected. And I was thinking about this week, you know, I heard a similar story about two weeks ago about how someone got a piece of sand in their eye. The exact same thing happened, just a small piece of sand. Got in their eye and it caused this major infection. They almost lost their eye. Also made me think maybe the devil owns the beaches, right? Maybe we shouldn't be going. Like, we're like, you know, one piece of sand in your eye could take your eye. Let's go lay in bazillions of them. That sounds like a great idea. And so it makes you think, like, man, sand, that's like, that's, that's like the devil's toy, right? Like, like, sand is a horrible thing. Like, we got to just, at this moment, we can clarify that sand is a bad thing, but that's not the truth, right? Because, like, if you take sand and you put it in an oyster, right, and it agitates the oyster, what's the oyster made? Come on, people. What is the oyster made? Somebody, left side smarter than right side today. It's okay. A pearl. A pearl. Maybe y'all are thinking this is about to preach. It is. Um, it makes a pearl. So it, sand isn't the devil. Sand is an agitator. And the agitator will eventually let us bring to surface something that was in, within us. And so when we have these things that agitate us in our life, the byproduct of the fruit we show that started in our heart has very little to do with the offense and in lots to do with inward deficiencies. So what's God want me to do? 
I'm just going to tell you right now, become the most forgiving one in the relationship. Now let me pause for a second. We'll talk about this next week with some mental health things. Um, I, I want to hear this clearly. This is not me saying you should stand for any type of abuse within relationships. You should not continually put yourself in a place or ever put yourself, uh, well, let me put yourself as a bad way of saying that. Um, you should remove yourself and run from all relationships that are abusive to you, to your health, to your mental health, and your life. I want you to hear that clearly. I, you hear me, right? Does everybody understand? This means yes in America, okay? This means yes in Bulgaria, but this means yes in America, okay? I want to be clear on this. Um, and, and by the way, forgiveness is not um, allowing the person to do it again. That's not what forgiveness is. Does that make sense? Uh, allowing again, that's a, a bad even word for it. Um, uh, forgiveness is not you saying it's okay for them to do it. It is not. That is not what we're saying when we say that. Let's continue Matthew chapter 5 as we get there because I want you to become the most forgiving person in every relationship. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, you remember, look at this, your brother and your sister has done something against you. This is picking up from the Raka passage, right? Don't murder. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. So if you came to church today, you came to bring a gift to the Lord, worship, whatever it might be. Maybe you brought other gifts. It says leave your gift there in front of the altar first and then go be reconciled with them. Then come and offer your gift. And then it says this, settle your matters quickly. Your adversary who is taking you to court, do it while you are still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and then you may be thrown into prison. Three ways to be the most forgiving person in the relationship so that you can have peaceful relationships and experience the blessing that comes through spiritual relationships. The first is realize what's happening. Not what you think is happening. Not what could happen. What their purpose, what, what's happening. Matthew chapter 5 verse 23, therefore if any of you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Maybe today it's just identifying one of those three things. What's happening? Is it offense? Is it guilt? Is it jealousy? It's probably going to land in one of those three. And once you've identified what the threat is to become the most forgiving person, cancel the debt. Because where there's a debt, there can't be intimacy. And you have the power to cancel the debt. Now, by the way, forgiving people is for your good more than theirs. You know that, right? Well, no, they did me so wrong, I can never forgive them. They're living their life no matter what you are doing in your life. And forgiving people is not letting them off the hook. It's finding a way to breathe again. Like when you have people who have offended your life, you're like, I'm going to hold on to this offense. It isn't changing anything about their life. But it will change yours. So cancel the debt. Not because they deserve it, but because you can never l walk into intimate relationships when you carry this debt. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Colossians 3, probably my least favorite passage in all of Scripture. Make allowance for each other's faults. No, thank you. Next verse, please. <laughs> can we go to verse 14? It's better. Verse 14 is better. You know what that means? It means, and I, lo I do love this passage because it literally just changed the trajectory of how I lived. It's saying make allowance for each other's faults, meaning um, have an amount that's permitted to, for people in their lives. Here's why. I'm going to tell you again. It's a selfish reason. It's not even for them. It's for you. Because have you ever met someone who's just always ready to be offended? Who's always ready to be hurt, always ready. Listen, it's for you. Allow allowance so that in every moment of your life, you're not just pissed off all the time. Sorry, Jesus. I need to apologize for that one. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't say pissed off in the first service, I promise. <laughs> I didn't. This is the one on live stream. Thanks. Hey. Hey, Mom. Love you. You think I won't get a text from my mom today? You're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. Children, listen, when you're 37 year old, your mom is still going to say, get on to you for saying bad words. Like, I want you to live a life that's just not always on the edge. And so if you make allowance for each other's faults, right? 
It's not our job to judge. We've already decided this, and here's what I mean by that. You can choose to become the judge, but you're going to be bad at it, and there's a judge we're all going to stand before, and I'm more worried about getting my life right before I stand before a judge than worrying about yours. Now, what's different is I actually have a little bit of a different role. Scripture says that as a pastor and as a shepherd, I actually am held accountable to your lives. So I am here to tell you something, but in your life as well, we need to learn to make some allowance. Why? Because the only one who is sovereign, meaning he's above all in wisdom and might and power, he's the one that still stands blameless. He's the one we will stand before. And look what Colossians 3 continues to say. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. I'm going to go back before you can read the rest of that. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. I think that's interesting. He didn't say make allowance for each other's faults and you won't need to extend forgiveness. He didn't say that. He said make allowance for each other's faults and guess what? Even with the allowance you make, somebody's still going to hurt you. And then forgive them. And if I was you and this was me as well, I would say, why? Why? Forgive anyone who offends you. Because remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Why would I forgive them? Because you were forgiven. Why should I extend grace to them? Because he extended grace to you. And even the one who had the authority to judge forgave you. The one who chose to see you as his own, covered by the blood of Jesus, reconciled through the cross. The one who permitted more than enough permission. Right, And then when you stepped over that and continued in your sin, he laid down his life so that he could forgive you of your sins. Yes, forgive others. Why? Because he forgave you. And that would be the last thing is forgive the debtor. Release the debt and forgive the debtor. You see, when your relationships are not peaceful, your life becomes painful. Matthew 25, I think this is interesting. You remember when we're talking about a brother? If a brother says raka, that sound, sorry, Cassidy, that sound. If you say fool, you're in the dangers of the fire of hell. If you're henna, right, your life's going to be hell. And then Matthew 25 says, settles matter quickly with your, look at this word, adversary. That's really interesting to me. Because if you go back to verse 23, this was your brother. We went from brother and sister to adversary in two verses. And some of you, that does not surprise you because you've had brothers and sisters go to adversary in two verses. Two verses, he was brother and sister. And now they're taking you to court. Do it while you're still together or then you'll be handed over to a judge, thrown in prison. Ephesians 4, get rid of all bitterness, rage, harsh, uh, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, look at this, be kind to each other, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Listen to me, no matter the relationship you're in, being married, being in community, being on mission, the trajectory of your relationships will not be shaped at how quickly you get hurt, but how quickly you can forgive. You can offer your gift at the altar, it says, and feel pretty good about yourself, but then go home and still be in a living hell. You can allow yourselves to be hurt by others and resent your life. And today can be a pivotal day for you because we'll look back on this day as the beginning process of healing between husbands and wives. Healing between parents and children. Healing between friends and community. Healing between people and God because of the people of God that have hurt you. Today, I think, could be the most pivotal day in the life of our church ever. Because all unapproached resentment leads to unforgettable regret. And today we're going to approach this. Because you are forgiven, you can forgive. It's not just grace that flows to you, but grace that flows through you. And what will be the result? Worship team, you can come up. Peaceful relationships. Peaceful relationships. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ, look at this, rule your hearts. Rule in your hearts. Why? Since as members of your one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. I was at a conference this weekend with our staff called Orange Conference, and I, uh, it was, I thought I would go to it and just have a good shared experience, and it was going to be good team building, like, yay, yeah, yay, yeah, let's go. We just got done with Easter. We're tired. Let's move forward. Let's grow the church. And we got to take some of our children's staff, some of our student staff, some of our worship staff, some of our leadership team, went to this conference. And you ever gone to something, and God just did far more than you ever expected? Maybe that's today for you. It was a conference that... Um, I mean, I came into it. I'm just saying all that to say thank you. Thank you for letting us get away. Y'all, y'all made that happen. Thank you for that. And one of the speakers read a text. And I 
saw something I've never seen before, and he revealed something I've never seen before. In Luke chapter 6, he read about this group of believers that we now call the 12 disciples. So in those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his, 12, called his disciples, all those who were following to him, and chose 12 of them. So this is where he chose the 12. He also, uh, he also designated the, them as apostles. And these are the ones he names. And he goes through Simon, uh, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, right? Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, uh, Simon, who's called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, Judas the Iscariot, who became a traitor. Can we talk about some of the characters for just a second? Because we know about a few, like, they really wanted you to know that Judas was a traitor. But um, you got Peter, James, and John. If you didn't know this, these are the class favorites. Jesus loved them more. He took them places, up mountains, class favorites. But what's really sad about this is Peter had a brother. You remember his name? His name was Andrew. So if I was to decide, if I was going to define Andrew, it would be this. Andrew, who's Peter's brother and not the class favorite, right? Then you got these guys, James and John. They were called the sons of thunder. I don't even know what that means, but it's awesome. If I'm going down to the Bible, I want to be a son of thunder. Then you got Judas. He's the worst. <laughs> Yeah, Matthew, tax collector. Let me pause. You think about tax collectors different. You're mad at your tax collectors right now. Not the same thing. Tax collectors, Matthew was contracted out by the Roman Empire to collect, collect taxes in with the Jews in Capernaum. He was contracted out to do this, not, um, and he didn't, he didn't, people think the tax collectors of scriptures that they were corrupt. No, 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 no. The Roman Empire was corrupt. And they were issued to go and do corrupt things on behalf of the Roman Empire. It wasn't like, oh my goodness, these tax collectors, if the Roman Empire found out, you'd be in trouble. No, they were doing what they were told to. The Roman Empire was trying to cheat people of their money, of their livelihood, and of their life. And these tax collectors were, the way I heard him explain this conference, I thought this was interesting. He said, it's like if you took the IRS and the mob and you mixed them together, right? And the tax collectors... Like, they're bad people, y'all. Like, so bad that if you remember Scripture, Jesus says he sat down and he ate with sinners and tax collectors. Like, they had their own category. They didn't even just fall into sinners. It was sinners and tax collectors, which just made me ask the question, if Jesus died for sinners, did he die for tax collectors? I don't know the answer, but I'm guessing it's a yes. And then you had a guy named Simon who was the zealot. And you think about zealot, you might put the pieces together of like being zealous, being like excited, overly done. But a zealot was actually a sect of people. This is what uh, theologian Pablo Torella says. The zealots were a Jewish sect within the Judea, uh, Judea province of the Roman Empire during the first century who sought to expel Romans from the area by violent means. Unlike other sects of the era, the zealots um, disagreed with Roman laws requiring the taxation of Judah, Judean citizens. Oh, and it cuts off there. Sorry, uh, I got more up here. Uh, Judean citizens and refused to recognize the emperor as good. I'm going to make it a little bit more basic. Zealots killed people who were part of the Roman Empire. It wasn't like, oh, you know, that zealot, he was a little extreme. It was their job and it was steered by their faith to rid of the Roman Empire, its corruption, and to do it by means of harm. Zealots were murder people who collaborated with the Romans. And now can you imagine this meeting the first time the 12 got together? Hey, I'm Jesus. I bet you're wondering why I called this meeting, right? If we could just go around the circle real quick, give you name. Let's know a little bit about you. All right. James and John stand up and go, hey, James and John, sons of thunder. And they're like, did you give yourself that name? They're like, oh, it'll stick. Don't worry about it. It'll, it'll stay. It'll stick. Keeps going around and saying, I'm Judas. You know, I'm a really good guy. Really, really good guy. I need y'all to know that, right? You can trust me with your money. Then we get around to Matthew. Matthew goes, hey, I'm Matthew. I'm a tax collector. And he gets to Simon. Simon has to make a big decision right now. And Simon is going to do what he's been taught within his religion.
religious beliefs and kill Matthew, because that's the only way, or is he going to follow Jesus? He has to make this decision. There's not, there's no two with it. He can't follow Jesus, right? Like he can't follow Jesus because if he follows Jesus, it means he has to walk with Matthew. And he is taught within his core so much so that he's put many to the sword, I'm sure, that he can't walk with Matthew. That Matthew stands in opposition of God. So can you imagine that? See, you can't follow Jesus and hold on to a fence. Simon had to make a decision, and so do you. Do I want to follow Jesus? And many of you have said yes to that. You've received Jesus. I want to follow Jesus, but you have to understand this. Some of us want to spend time with Jesus, but remove ourselves from others, and that's not an option. Simon had to make a decision, and so do you. Do I want to come to Jesus, or do I want to follow Jesus? Because Simon could have shown up, came to Jesus, and be like, Hey, Jesus, awkward situation, but I don't agree with everybody here, so I'm going to leave, but I think you're a great guy. Show up on Sundays anytime you want. God is cool. I'm here for a second. I can't really hang out with these people because in the lobby earlier I heard someone talking and their, and their um, political views are different than mine, so I'm not going to actually spend some time here. Instead, of, But I will come because you're a good guy, Jesus. Like I came, but I heard somebody talk about how they raised their kids, and I just couldn't disagree more with that. And so here's the truth. I'm willing to come to you, but I can't follow you. So do you want to follow Jesus and walk with your enemies, or do you want to view him from afar because I must distance myself from those I oppose? See, following Jesus at a distance means you'll lose him at every turn. That's not peace. And to make room for Jesus, I must embody peace, which means I must extend grace by canceling debt, offering forgiveness. Peace is only found where there's Jesus, but there's probably chaos there as well. Peaceful relationships are when the zealot chooses to follow Jesus with the tax collector. Peace is when we tell Jesus, not my ways, but yours. If you haven't learned this about collectivists, we are a collective movement. You will find every different life, world, viewpoint in this room. i got to tell you something. I think lots of you have decided you want to follow Jesus. Following Jesus means walking with others building longer tables, not so that people can come to our side, but so that we can all consume the things of God, things like the fruit of the Spirit, peace, love, joy, patience, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. But if we're trying to build tables that only have our views, we're going to find people we like, but we're not going to find Jesus. Today, I want you to find Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, would you just be ever-present with us in this moment? We love you. Whatever offenses in our heart, whatever we've come to bring to you in worship right now, Father, may we leave it if we need to go and be reconciled, offer forgiveness, release debts, so that peace can surpass understanding in our relationship, so that we can experience more of you in this world. In Jesus' name. I'm going to offer you a time of prayer. Why don't you go ahead and stand with me? We're going to worship for one song really quick. I'm going to be over here next to our kneeling altar. If you need somebody to come, if you need somebody to pray with you, if you just walk over to that area, if you kneel, I'm going to pray with you today, right? Like, you come over there. And if you have things you need to let go of, I'm there. I'm going to ask Dee if she'll be available in the back. She'll be available um, back there um, next to that curtain area if you need to step away. Um, and, uh, oh, Dee, you're on the other side today. I'm just kidding. Right here. And let's just have a time of worship. And I think above everything else, don't bring an altar, don't bring God... Um, praise to the altar if today we're harboring hardships in our heart. Let's drop those offenses. Forgive them in this moment. We can do that today. Right now.